don't know if it's just me, but sometimes self-help or personal development, whatever you want to call it, just feels too serious. Fear is self-imposed, meaning it doesn't exist. You create it, you can destroy it too. Let's fix that. And who wants to RBF their way through life all the time anyway? So I was incredibly excited when my ex-husband, Dr. Andrew Huberman, said... Play is powerful, and we could even say that play is the most powerful portal to plasticity. Neuroplasticity, noun. The brain's ability to modify, change, and adapt both structure and function throughout life and in response to experience. So in plain English, neuroplasticity just means our brain's ability to learn and grow. So it's no surprise that kids' brains are way more plastic compared to adults, and that's how they pick up everything so quickly, even their parents' bad habits. I want to beat the shit out of you. <laughs> now here, we're talking about the type of neuroplasticity that helps you acquire proficiency, adaptability, skills in almost every facet of life. And although our brains do become much less plastic around our mid-20s or so, there are still ways to improve neuroplasticity. So now, going back to what I was talking about before, about personal development being way too intense, way too serious, even though it's actually being in a state of play that you develop much faster. Cool, so we can just play video games all day or act goofy and silly and we'll be neuroplastic, right? Wrong! Well, at least there's more to it than that. There are guidelines on how you incorporate play into your life, and if you're serious about enhancing your neuroplasticity, you can't be too serious because that's not how it works. Hold on, allow me to explain the basics first. Okay, so what I'm about to go over is from a two-hour episode of the Huberman Lab podcast. The link's in the description if you want to invest the two hours, but if you don't have the attention span for that, I'm going to regurgitate some of the main things that you need to know, which is why play helps with neuroplasticity and how to implement it in your life. And here's the really important part. This is not just about getting better at whatever it is you're playing. With more intentional play, we can reactivate a lot of circuitries that promote neuroplasticity in all sorts of areas. Disclaimer, I'm not affiliated with Huberman Lab in any sort of way. I am just a huge fan. Okay, so let's get nerdy for a second here and briefly talk about how your brain works with play. First of all, play helps you produce a substance that is significant in running many cognitive functions. Here's how it works. Play is generated in an area of your brain called the periaqueductal gray. Let's just call it PEG for short. So PEG is rich with endogenous opioids, which means basically just self-made opioids. It's not the same as like heroin or fentanyl. Those are exogenous. That means they're from an external source. But these endogenous opioids also dope you up a little. And anytime we play, they get released. And that opens up the number of functions our prefrontal cortex can handle. And if you're super nerdy, you know that the prefrontal cortex runs things like um, self-control, problem solving, planning, decision making, etc. To quickly summarize, play releases endogenous opioids and these opioids open a part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex, that gives you the capability to basically handle a ton of different cognitive functions. And that itself is pretty effing cool if you ask me. But wait, there's more. Play also helps you explore what's called contingency testing. Now, what the hell does that mean? Let's break that down. Contingency testing means that we explore situations where we learn if A happens, then B happens. So contingency testing helps us to expand the number of outcomes we're willing to entertain. And we put ourselves in a position where we're making new predictions about what's going to happen next. It's your game. Not only that, play through contingency testing also helps us explore how we behave when we assume different roles. So am I a leader or a follower? Do I play better one-on-one -on -one or in groups? And you know what the cool thing about that is? It helps us understand other people better too. You know the advice we've all heard about when going on a first date, observe how your date treats the waiter and that'll tell you how they treat you? No, there's a much better way to get to know someone. Play a game with them. I want to play a game. Sure, like that, but maybe less serial killer vibes and where the stakes aren't too high. Take your date to an arcade or play a board game, something just a little challenging but not too much, and you'll get to know their personality real fast. Give me all your lumber, mother 
Are they a hard ass on rules? Do they tend to cheat? Do they work well with others? Not only is it a great personality test, you get to develop neuroplasticity together. Aww. So there are guidelines on how to actually get into an optimal play state to engage neuroplasticity. So number one, uh, press that like button down below. Apparently that's like really important for brain development. I don't know, it's science. Number one and a half, uh, you need novelty. Continuing to do the same things doesn't help with neuroplasticity. So if you play chess all the time, explore other games or games where you play against multiple people. If you're always doing team sports, maybe try something one-on-one. -on -one. Number two, you need contingency testing. Engage in activities that allow for the if-then scenarios and put yourself in a position where you're constantly having to make predictions on what happens next. Number three, you cannot be too attached to the outcome. You can't be too competitive. That's because you need both dopamine and a small level of adrenaline to be released. Now remember the exogenous opioids we talked about that helps your prefrontal cortex? Too much adrenaline prevents the release of those opioids, which is why we need it to be low stakes. High stakes equals high adrenaline. If you're too competitive, you won't get into that state of play. Give me all your lumber, mother Dude, chill. We're just trying to play. You're taking this too seriously. You're just saying that because I'm white. What? Whatever. Last time you called my cousin a little bitch for not trading your sheep for ore. So? He's nine. You made him cry. Dude, read the box. The perfect board game for everyone ex except for little bitches. Now there are times when being hyper-focused and super serious can be a good thing for learning. If you're simply learning by rote memory, memorizing and regurgitating, trying to cycle through that information over and over again. Sure, that's great for that, but again, if you want to stretch yourself and enhance cognitive functions like decision-making, uh, planning, self-control, problem-solving, and so on, Taking a playful approach is the way to go. Well, that wraps up this video on play and neuroplasticity. And you know what's another cool game though? Replay this video and drink every time I say neuroplasticity. Thanks again to Huberman Lab for allowing me to borrow their research. And joking aside, Dr. Andrew Huberman is sharing some really awesome life-changing research. But every time I share his podcast, nobody watches it because it's two hours long. So the goal of my videos is to make his information a little more digestible for those who just don't have the attention span. Special thanks to Masha for letting me borrow her nerdy game and thank you very much for pressing subscribe like right now. Look at the camera, Pepper, look. Subscribe! That button right there. <laughs>